Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, well, welcome to the BOFAS uh, Scientific Journal Club this evening. Uh, we've got uh, two talks this evening on Achilles tendon ruptures, and we're talking on the non operative ma management. Uh, and so we've got Rebecca Kearney, uh, Professor Rebecca Kearney, who's at Bristol Medical School, who's one of the uh, uh, physiotherapists and director of Bristol Trials. And we've also got Amory Hutchison, consultant physiotherapy from Swansea Bay. So what I'd like to do is start off with Amory Hutchison's paper, and uh, she's going to talk through our paper and then go on and talk about some current management. My name is Anne-Marie Hutchison. I'm a consultant physiotherapist from Swansea Bay University Health Board. And I've been asked to present this evening our paper that we published in the um, Bone and Joint Journal back in 2015. Essentially, this paper is on our protocol called the SMART protocol. The study design is a descriptive case series. And the background to this study it was at a time when the treatment of, a, of an Achilles rupture was controversial. It was thought that um, if you were managed conservatively, there was a higher chance of a re-rupture, but a lower chance of complication. And if you were managed with an operation, um, there was a lower chance of a re-rupture, but a higher chance of a complication. Hence, conservative treatment were reserved for patients with the comorbidities, and surgical treatment was recommended for patients with a higher activity demand. Also, the traditional way to immobilize the patients at this time was in a cluster. And then there was the development or the release of um, walking boots for patients with the uh, um, Achilles rupture. This allowed the patient to walk on the boot and also remove it for some early immobilization exercises. Managing the patient via this approach in the boot became termed the functional approach. So these boots were introduced at a time when our foot and ankle orthopedic consultant, Mr. Williams, ruptured his Achilles tendon. Um, he was reviewing the boot one day with a wrap, and then 10 days later, he found himself in the boot, having ruptured the Achilles. So the problem we had was there was little information available about um, how to manage a patient within the boot. So we developed our protocol then called the SMART protocol, known as the Swansea Morriston Achilles Rupture Treatment. So the objective of our protocol was to have a rationalised decision-making process for the management of an acute Achilles rupture as well as develop a comprehensive rehabilitation regime. So our paper includes all the patients that we put through this protocol when it commenced in 2008 to when we wrote the paper um, in 2014. All our patients are acute ruptures and we define this as a patient sustaining an injury, an Achilles rupture injury within two weeks or attending us, seeing us within two weeks. So the method, it's essentially our protocol. This is protocol takes the patient from a &E through to being discharged once the um, boot is removed and they return back to their sports. So in a &E, we ask the um, a &E department to place the patients in an Aquinas back slab for them to be non-weight bearing and then to bring them back to our next day fracture clinic. In the fracture clinic, we then request an ultrasound scan, and this would help us make a decision of if the patient should be managed with or without an operation. And if they manage without an operation, what's the best position to put the ankle in? We then developed some guidelines in relation to the results from the ultrasound scan, which was if our patient is 55 or less, 
They have a rupture, which is a complete rupture in the body of the tendon. And when we put the foot in varying positions of equinus, we can reduce the gap by more than a centimetre. And we recommend the patient has surgery. Otherwise, all other patients are managed conservatively. They then seen or immobilized in a cast, either postoperatively or immediately if they're managed conservatively for two weeks, and then placed into a walk-in orthosis. Following removal of boot, we developed strict guidelines, for returns to sport um, and work. So essentially, our protocol had three main parts to it. The scan, the functional approach, and the supervised physiotherapy. So we go through each. So in relation to the scan, the purpose of the scan was to confirm the diagnosis to ensure that we were managing patients who had an Achilles rupture and not a differential diagnosis. And then to help us determine if the patient should be managed with or without the operation, as I explained in the previous slide. And then if they had managed without the operation, what was the best position to place the ankle in? Our radiologists worked with us on this and helped to devise this performer to provide the information to the um, doctors in the fracture clinic. So they completed this form saying whether the rupture was a partial or a complete rupture, where the site of the rupture was in the body of the tendon or at the muscular tennis junction. They shaded in this view the amount of tendon that it had ruptured, their level of confidence, and then they told us the gap size and the varying positions of the quinus that we could get with both the cast and various boots. Just to demonstrate this, you can see the gap between the tendon ends here. And as we bring the foot up into an equinus position, we're looking at how closely together the tendon ends um, come. So this is it on an ultrasound scan. You can see the rupture is in the middle of the screen here, the black area. So as this patient's foot has been brought up into a plantar flex position, you can see that the gap closes and the tendon ends come together completely. Therefore, in our protocol, this patient would be managed non-operatively. So the second main part of our protocol was um, the guidelines of taking the patient through the functional approach in both the cast and the boot. And to do this, we developed a clinic that we call the Achilles Clinic. And this is a physiotherapist-led clinic. So we pulled all our patients from the fracture clinic to be seen by um, physiotherapists. The aim of this was to increase the consistency in care and stop, stop variation in care. So initially, the patients were placed, whether they were operated on or not, in an Aquinas cast for two weeks, non weight bearing. And then they were placed into a flexible boot, which they could walk on for a further eight weeks. During that week, eight week process, the physios in the Achilles clinic would follow these guidelines and bring the patient's foot back gradually to a plantigrade position. They'll also commence exercises at five weeks into the protocol. Once the boot is removed, the, phys the patient is then referred to the local physio department where he asks the physios to follow guidelines in terms of returning the patient back to sport. So because this was a new protocol, we wanted to monitor it to check that it was safe, particularly in terms of the rupture rates, how the patients were getting on. So we asked them to complete the questionnaire called the Achilles Tendon Repair Score, also known as the ATRS, as well as the Achilles Tendon, sorry, the Achilles Tendon Rupture Score, the ATRS, and then the Achilles Tendon Repair Score. Both these scores are out of 100. The closer to 100 the patient is, the better they do in. We also recorded any complications, as well as the cost implications of this new protocol. All our data was put in SPSS and analysed in SPSS. We did a descriptive data analysis, which included the demographics, the rate of re ruptures in terms of frequencies, the ATRS scores, and the repair scores in terms of means and standard deviations at four months, six months, and nine months, the complications, the frequency of these, and then an economic evaluation to look at the costs. 
So our results, our demographics showed that the average age of a patient to rupture was 46 and a half, more males than females. And at the time, approximately a quarter of all patients were being managed surgically. Our re rupture rate was 1.1%, with just three patients rupturing, re rupturing out of 273. Our, our um, questionnaire scores at four months, six months, and nine months were very comparable with the literature. In terms of the elite athletes or the high activity demand patient, I can just show some examples of a few patients and their results. So this is a ballerina who ruptured her right side. This was managed conservatively. And this is her at nine months post rupture. And then a rugby player, professional rugby player, hopping on his good leg. And then on the ruptured leg, again, nine months post injury, and he was managed conservatively. Just one more example this is a young girl who's a badminton player, ruptured. Okay. So our complication rate, you can see our DVT rate is 5.5%, P rate below 2%, no pressure sores, a few minor complications, for example, numbness in the foot, pain under the heels, and muscular um, skeletal complaints, for example, aches and pains in other joints. And one patient fell, and that was one of our re rupture patients. In terms of cost, comparing this to our old way of working, um, this resulted in nearly a £92,000 saving per annum to our health board. So despite the boots costing slightly more than the casts and us scanning every single patient, which we never did before, the main savings were by the fact that we reduced the number of patients receiving operations. So how is study showed a very low re rupture rate of 1.1%. There's a number of reasons that this may have been the case. It could be because we use the ultrasound scan to make the decision of how to manage the patients. It might be the fact that we pull all our patients into a designated clinic to be reviewed to reduce the inconsistencies in care that sometimes happens through the traditional fracture clinic. Um, we place the patients in a cast for the first two weeks that are managed um, conservatively. This stabilizes the hematoma as well as um, makes the patient aware of the severity of the injury. And then um, following the removal of the immobilization, we've got strict rehabilitation protocol. Our outcome measures are satisfactory and very comparable to the literature for both patients managed conservatively and surgically, as well as our VTE rate being very comparable to the literature. So there's limitations to this study. So it's a descriptive case series rather than a randomized control trial. Um, the aim of this was to monitor safety rather than efficacy of the treatment. And we, all, and we continue to monitor it as it's an evolving um, protocol. The secondary outcome measure, the repair score, requires you to use an uh, isoconnected machine, which we didn't have in clinic. So we modified one of the outcome measures, one of the questions in the outcome measure to compare it against the heel raise. But despite these limitations, we felt it was worth reporting 
um, our outcome due to the low re-rupture rate. And we presented it in the BOFAST conference in Belfast in 2013. And following this presentation, we had many requests from a number of centres throughout the UK um, for the detailed specifics of our protocol. So due to the number of requests we were getting, we, we um, managed to publish the paper in the journal of bone and joint. So then it meant in the future, then we could direct um, other centres to the paper and it was freely available for everybody. So I've also asked, been asked to present any changes that we've made since 2014 and then the implications of any of these. So the changes that we have made have been minor. Um, firstly, the conservatively managed patients, we asked them to weight bear in the first two weeks. They were non-weight bearing in, in our old protocol. And the aim of this was to try and reduce our DVT weight. We also now ask the patients to make a final adjustment of the boot at home. All our surgeons refer into the protocol. The boot has changed slightly. There's been staff changes because this is a multidisciplinary approach. So we've had changes in radiologists and we've also trained up more physiotherapists. We've introduced guidelines for the professional sports people due to the um, professional sports teams in our area, particularly rugby and football. We've worked with them to produce guidelines for um, the elite. And also we've introduced hydrotherapy guidelines since we had a re-rupture in hydropro. This is just more recently. So this is the cast that we get the patients to walk in immediately. So still a cast, which um, is the best position which the tendon ends meet. We put a little wedge in the bottom, which allows the patients to walk on it. In terms of the elite sports people, because the professional teams have sophisticated equipment, as well as um, daily physiotherapy, we work with the teams using some of the uh, advanced technologies, I suppose. So for example, the Alter G treadmill, reduces the amount of gravity which goes through the legs, so the weight bearing which goes through the legs meant that we can start the elite athletes running sooner than we can our NHS cohort of patients. So our results, when we amalgamate um, them into the, the previous results, so from the four years, this is now a total of 13-year results. Our demographics are still very comparable. There's been a reduction in the number of operations. And you can see on this graph the trend in the decreased number of operations over time. Our re rupture rate has remained around the same, which is less than 2%. Our um, PROM scores have remained very comparable. If you look at the ATRS, um, 8 is seen as a clinical meaningful change. The change has been less than 2 two or three. In terms of complications, these have remained comparable, apart from the DVT rate, which has actually gone up to 9% from 5%. And just out of interest, if you compare a surgically managed patients to a conservatively managed patients, you can see that the results are very comparable for these, and more or less fall within that clinical meaningful change. So a summary with the changes, like I said, the demographics are comparable, the re rupture rate is comparable, as well as the um, outcome scores. The DVT detection rate is higher. So we think our DVT rate is higher because obviously we're only scanning patients who've got symptomatic DVTs. And the more we scan and detect, the lower our threshold becomes to scan these patients. So the only way to really know the true DVT rate is to scan all patients symptomatic or non-symptomatic. The P rate is comparable to before and our complication rates are comparable. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was an excellent uh, talk regarding your paper. Uh, it's very interesting to hear it from yourself. 
uh, the videos added, and also to hear the update and the additional data from the next kind of five years added on to there. So we're going to go to question and answers at the end when we've gone through uh, both talks and we're just using the question and answer feature. So we're not using the chat feature and we're not using the raise the hand. Uh, but what I'd like to do now is move on to our next speaker, Professor Becca Kearney, and she's going to talk through her paper on the UK STAR randomised trial. With that, though, we, my fellow has put a presentation regarding the actual detail of the paper, and then Professor Kearney will then speak afterwards. Yes, please. Good evening, everyone. My name is Akshdeep Bhava. I'm the foot and ankle fellow at Norfolk and Norwich Hospital. I'll be presenting on the UK STAR trial. This was a multi-center randomized control trial and economic evaluation done comparing plaster cast versus functional brace for non-surgical treatment of Achilles tendon ruptures. It was published in The Lancet in February 2020. Among the prominent authors were Prof. Matt Costa and Prof. Rebecca Kearney. So as we all know, it's an increasingly common injury. There have been small R cities before comparing surgical versus non-surgical treatment, showing no difference. So non-surgical treatment is being increasingly preferred. There is, however, little evidence on the best non-surgical treatment of Achilles ruptures before this trial. No clear benefit of functional brace uh, was established by Costa et al. in 2006, but it was deemed practically advantageous with immediate weight bearing. The aim of this trial was to compare functional and quali quality of life outcomes and resource use after plaster cast versus functional brace and to determine the superiority of the cast over functional brace for conservative treatment of Achilles ruptures. This was a pragmatic superiority multi-center randomized control trial done at 39 hospitals across the UK. All patients 16 years and above treated non-operatively for primary Achilles tendon ruptures were included in the study. All patients presenting with a delayed injury 14 days afterwards or with previous ruptures of same Achilles tendon were excluded, as were the patients who were unable to complete the questionnaires. They were randomized to a plaster cast of functional brace for eight weeks. Clinical follow-ups were done with questionnaire outcome scores. Coming to the plaster cast group, baloney plaster cast was applied in a gravity coinous position. The position was gradually changed until the foot was plantigrade. Full wet bearing was commenced after six weeks and the cast was removed at eight weeks. The functional brace group had removable rigid walking boots applied initially with two solid heel wedges. They could immediately wet bear from the brace application. The number of wedges and the foot position was reduced over eight weeks. The primary outcomes were measured by the Achilles tendon rupture scores at nine months. Secondary outcomes were the ATRS measured at other time points the health-related quality of life, the EQ5D, 5L, and complications such as tendon re ruptures DVT and pulmonary embolism, falls with or without injury, pain under the heel, pressure sores, and numbness around the foot. A health and economic statistical analysis was also done. It was deemed that the minimum clinically important difference for primary outcome was about eight points. How this materialized was, at an individual level, the ability to walk upstairs or run with some difficulty versus with great difficulty. At the population level, it was the difference between a healthy patient and a patient with minor disability. The results. So it was performed between August 15th, 2016 and May 31st, 2018. 1,451 patients were screened. 375 deemed not eligible for the study, 534 could not be randomized, and two were excluded because of other reasons. 540 participants were randomly allocated to receive plaster cast or a functional brace. The mean age was 48.7 years, 
predominantly male patients, 79%, and majority happened during sports, about 70%. The primary outcome, ATRS, was about 74.4 in plaster cast versus 72.8 in the functional brace. So note statistical significance in the difference at nine months. There was a statistically significant difference, but clinically equivocal difference in the ATRS at eight weeks in favor of functional brace, but not at three months or six months. The tendon retractures were about 5% in the functional brace and 6% in the cast. Significantly, no retractures happened six months after the injury and there was no evidence of difference in complication profiles. The EQ5D5L scores were better in the brace early in the patient's recovery, but again, no difference at nine months. Coming to the health economic analysis, the direct intervention cost for a plaster cast was only 36 pounds versus 109 pounds. But if you compare the total costs, including the services and intervention, during the whole of the patient's treatment, it was 1181 for the plaster cast versus 1,078 pounds for the functional brace, which means a difference of 103 pounds in favor of functional brace, but again, not statistically significant. The strengths of this trial, it was use of multiple centers, clinicians reflecting the care provided across the UK, a large number of participants, 93% completed the follow-up. They used validated PROMs in, uh, in terms of the ATRS, and they had adequately powered study for clinical and statistical significance. There were a few limitations. It was a pragmatic trial. They couldn't, it could not be um, blinded as the assessors could see the intervention. So there was potential observer bias. 58% of eligible uh, patients they agreed to participate. So the conclusion of the trial was that traditional plaster casting was not found to be superior to early weight bearing in a functional brace, measured by the ATRS in non-surgically treated Achilles tendon ruptures. So the authors recommended early weight bearing in a functional brace as a safe and cost-effective alternative to plaster casting. Thank you very much, Ashti. That's a very good summary of the paper. Uh, so we're going to move on to uh, Becky. Uh, and so Becky, would be very grateful if you can give us uh, an update on that paper, kind of regarding the, the clinical side and the research side of, of where it's led for you. Thanks. Um, I just want to acknowledge the funding from the National Institute for Health Research for that study as well. Um, so I, as being presented, we had a really clear result of early functional gains in the, in the boot, but there was no differences then at three, six and nine months. And although the boot was more expensive as an initial cost, when you looked at that over the whole care pathway, it was more cost effective. Um, so the big question with any clinical trial is, is this going to change clinical practice? Um, the way in which we measure that is quite easy in some trials. So, for example, if you're doing surgical trials, then you can measure how many um, operations are done on registries and so forth. Um, but for this, it was, it was a little bit trickier. Um, so in the development work for this, we ran a, a national survey um, uh, simply asking, what do you do in your clinical practice? Do you use boots? Do you use cast? And, and based on that uncertainty, we were able to launch the UK STAR trial. So one of the things that we've done since um, is we applied for funding through the um, Orthopaedic Trauma Society um, to rerun the survey for two reasons. One was to see if practice had changed. And the second thing was that one of the findings in the trial that surprised me as a physiotherapist was that physiotherapy um, provision was very patchy across the UK. So although we've just heard a fantastic presentation from Anne-Marie around um, the number of physiotherapy sessions that the patients get and they're seeing dedicated Achilles tendon rupture clinics. Um, there was quite a, a large pool of patients within the trial that didn't have any rehabilitation. Um, uh, and when, so we did a little bit of secondary analysis um, and we, 
we couldn't see on the surface any real differences really between the, the pool of patients that had additional physiotherapy and the pool of patients and that, that hadn't. Um, so what so what this led to then was a, a workshop, which I, I know David you, you attended, where we, we kind of broached this idea of do patients need routine physiotherapy after an Achilles tendon rupture, or actually do they need good materials, good resources that they can refer to? Um, we did get to a point of putting a funding application in, which was turned down um, because it seemed it needed further development work. Um, so we're now just at a point where we're waiting for a, a, an enthusiastic PhD student <laughs> to take this forward, because um, it's clear that there, there is a gap there. And, and Anne-Marie presented a, um, a, a very robust case series, but the, the actual development work, work into the rehabilitation, as she said in her presentation, it's just not there. Uh, we're, we're almost guessing at what we should be doing rather than knowing what we should be doing. So I think there's two parts to it. There's how much physiotherapy do you need and what should that content of physiotherapy look like? Um, so has it changed practice? Yes, the survey showed that, that it, I think it was fairly non it wasn't a contentious study. I think clinicians were happy to, on the basis that you got early functional results and it was cost effective to change over to using boot rehabilitation. Um, and when we've presented at conferences, uh, again, that's kind of been met rather positively. Um, so I think there's just this big gap now about what do you do eight weeks after an Achilles tendon rupture? What happens between eight weeks and nine months? Thank you. So what we'll do now is if we bring everyone back in, and, uh, and we'll get up the question and answer panel. Uh, I will also just say to all the participants uh, who've joined us that for feedback, you'll get an email and there's also a QR code at the end. Um, so we've got a couple of questions. And so let's start in here. So I think this is, these were came up, Anne-Marie, when you were talking and, and they were asking about your DVT prophylaxis. Yes, um, I was going to get Miss Topless to answer that. Miss Topless has written something back in the answers. Claire, are you okay to take that question? Have I lost her? All right, well, what she's written down all patients were risk assessed and low molecular weight heparin used when higher risk patients identified. All patients chose low molecular weight heparin. Okay, so, so it's on that risk assessment that was done. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to fill in the gaps, but so yeah, we risk assess our patients using um, a local risk assessment form. Patients with the higher risk factors, um, we put them on the anticoagulant. It was um, heparin for 4,000 milligrams. No, um, and then we changed it to Inhixa recently. Okay. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and then we counsel the patients then who aren't put on it to be vigilant in relation to. BTE, um, and that's pretty much our protocol. You can oh. see our, re our DVT rate has increased. I think the reason for that is because we are actually more vigilant and we got a lower threshold now for scanning our patients when they come back to the Achilles clinic, because you find the more you scan, the, the more you pick up, the lower your threshold becomes to send them for a Doppler scan. I agree. And I think we, we've recently been involved, uh, the BOFAS, on uh, VTE guidance and looking at the evidence with the uh, American Society through Prof Parsi and and that again interesting there's, there's a, not clear evidence whether you should be doing so all patients or whether we're just looking at a specific high-risk patients as well uh, so I, I think I'm sticking with you Anne-Marie so the next one's come through and it's asking about the radiology um, and the the variation in those measurements. Okay. Uh, now I see on your, your paper, you quite clearly have a, a standardized form and actually your ultrasound quite showed the obvious gap when it's reducing and um, coming together. Um, have you found, have you had any differences from the radiologists coming through with what they're reporting? Well, interestingly, a radiologist can get on the call now, but I brought him on our WhatsApp video here, so he's listening into this. And he's stayed down in West Wales, especially for this call tonight. So, it, what, so are you asking really what's the inter and inter reliability of the radiologists? That's right. Yeah, we we haven't done a study looking at that, so we don't know. 
that they tend to match. Um, to be honest, we don't know unless we did that study. I don't know, Rodri, do you have any feel on that with the, with the radiologists, the internet reliability of them? I'll let you go and move it. Rodri, you need to unmute it. Amory, with the, I think I asked, I always fight with the ultrasounds, uh, and I saw from your paper that there are two things that I thought were interesting. One, over time, you're doing less and less operating compared to 2008 when this started. And you say that the indication was when the gap was less than a centimetre. Um, so did you find that the majority of time the gap is less than a centimetre? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's interesting because other people use kind of two centimetres or even three centimetres. And, uh, and, and I do sometimes wonder if that is from the variation of how we're measuring that in there. Um, and now, did it Roger, make... Roger, radiologist wants to just chip in. Is that okay? I don't know how well this yeah, is going to work. He's going to try and speak off my phone to you okay. for some reason. It didn't work on the, for him to join the Zoom call. Sorry. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. I think that the variability in what, you, what you're talking about, I mean, Amory was uh, extremely diligent uh, with me and taught me. And the big thing was that actually, it is actually our uh, learning curve for, uh, for me was actually learning what was neutral position, 15 degrees of plant action, 30 degrees, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, because that's where the difference comes in, is where we just get the patient to lie prone on the table, get them removed down so their ankle or their foot is dangling off the end of the bed. And sometimes we'd be scanning with their foot is in 30 degrees of plant affection. We think it was neutral, it wasn't neutral, et cetera, et cetera. So Anne-Marie was very good and early on in, in uh, this, then we went through and uh, she came around with a tractor and actually taught us then about actually measuring. So I think that in the initial phase gave us the reliability, but I, I have no doubt but if you are actually just um, introducing this service, radiologists aren't being aware of that, then there will be significant variability from what we think is mild plant deflections, maximum plant deflection, neutral position, etc. And I think that's something that if you are going to do it and take measurements, then you need to have a very reproducible system. Thank you very much. So, Becky, moving to yourself. Uh, so we've got a question just come through and it talked about with the protocol and it says what protocol was used to change the position of the foot in the plaster cast? Was it time bound or when the plaster was loose? Um, it, was, it was time bound. So they, um, they wore their boots or cast um, for approximately eight weeks and the uh, position of quietness was changed approximately every two weeks. Obviously, it was a pragmatic trial, um, so there was some slight variances within that, and we captured that data and reported it in detail. Um, uh, you know, things happen like bank holiday, you know, to be clinics on a Monday and there's a bank holiday, it'd be three weeks instead of two weeks. But in general terms, that's what the protocol was. And, so, and, I, and I suppose my main question from the, well, from both studies, really, and is, and people question this, is the elongation of the tendon and does that have a factor when it's healing? Uh, and so do you believe the ATRS, which is the main one, I know you also use the ARS, summary, but do you think the ATRS is a good enough outcome score for the Achilles tendon rupture? I'm happy to take that question. I uh, one of my PhD chapters was on the validity mm. of the ATRS. Um, so I've published a paper on it, and it seems to perform quite well when you compare it to other outcome measures. Um, so I, I, not every aspect of validity of that outcome has, has been assessed, and uh, we all know validity is on a spectrum. Um, but compared to other orthopedic outcomes that are used regularly in big trials, the ATRS has got more evidence behind it than most. Okay. Um, I think for me, one of the problems with the ATRS score is for the sedentary patient. 
because the score is out of 100, but the last three questions, the sedentary patient is always going to score naught. So a lower activity demand patient. So I don't know, did you in your trial account for that then, um, Becky? So some people then they just score them out of 100 and that's empty and then percentage it out of 70. No, so for just, us, we always took it out of 100. I was yeah, we, we just yeah. took it out of 100. And then obviously just through the process of randomization, we assume that there'll be a, an equal number of high level sports people you know, in, in both yeah. groups if randomization's done its job. Um, but I, that, that is a criticism of the score. And uh, I don't know if you know the person, Marie, uh, Marie but I, I, I did meet a physiotherapy PhD student whose PhD was around developing a sedentary version of the ATRS. So it is, it is an area that's, that's been looked at and a criticism of that score. Um, but I suppose to answer the question around, is it sensitive enough to pick up elongation? And I don't think there's been any discriminatory validity papers on the ATRS looking at that specific question but as I said it, it did seem to perform quite well. Okay uh, and then uh, just asking Becky just to clarify they've said in your in your study on the UK star uh, which boot was used? Yeah so because it was a pragmatic trial we didn't um, mandate an exact uh, manufacturer that all hospital sites had to use and um, so instead they got a, a set of principles around what types of boots were, were allowed essentially and so we specified that it had to be a, a, a rigid rocker bottom um, boot that had removable wedges. Okay and was there any follow-up regarding or questions regarding the BTE prophylaxis in the UK star? No, so uh, again, we allowed sites to um, to do what they would normally do as part of their normal clinical care, but we recorded what happened um, and, and that was fed into our health economic analysis as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's just see. Okay. So, okay. Well, on that note, how it's a pragmatic study, actually, we've just had a comment coming through just saying how it, it's good for us all to be using the BOFAS registry where we have got the Achilles tendon rupture scores and the other scores as well. So if you are out there and you're able to score your patients, then please do so through the BOFAS registry. Um, okay, so an interesting one actually, back, Anne-Marie, back to yourself. For the SMART protocol, uh, when do you let them take the boot off? Can they take it off to wash or can they take it off to, at night? or uh, are they allowed to take it off at all? No, so um, we put them in the boot at week two, and then they're in the boot from week two to week eight, during which is the period that we bring the foot back to the plantar flex and um, plantar grade position. So during that period, we tell them they need to wear the boot at night for shower and bath. They're allowed to take it off while sitting on the bed. They foot mustn't go near the floor to just for hygiene purposes to wash the leg but they have to keep their foot down in a plantar flex position, dry the leg completely, and then put the boot back on. And then even at the end of the protocol, so at the end of the eight weeks, we remove the boot, we give them a little heel raise for their shoe, but we leave them with the boot to wear in vulnerable environments over the next six weeks. So for us, that's an example of that would be our rugby players <laughs> when they're out drinking on nights out etc or people go to a concert step where there's lots of steps stairs and people um at the moment people go to weddings we tell them to put it on for that and then occasionally we've seen uh, patients who do get uh, blisters and sores from the boots uh and invariably i see it more in the elderly and they tend to get them on the dorsum of the foot and I sometimes feel they're trying to recruit, they may be a bit older, they don't have the same sort of balance and they're trying to recruit other tendons. Is that a problem you see at all? Um, no, I think initially we saw it a little bit, but the, one of the main problems for that is people put the boot on too tight. Okay. So they either put the gray liner on too tight or the straps over too tight. So we tell them it, the boot can feel like a Wellington. It doesn't have to be pulled on tight. I mean, educate the patients around that. It's not the compressive effect of the boot that is supporting them. It's the position that the foot is in and a small amount of movement within the boot, they still will be safe. Okay. Well, I like that analogy. It should feel like a, a Wellington boot. I think most patients will, will be able to um, relate to that. That's a good one. Okay. Um, I'm just seeing if there's anyone else coming through. All right. Um, 
gone quiet for a moment. While you're looking at your questions, I was just yeah. going to say I didn't put in our follow up for future step was that we're developing a hop, uh, an app called Pop to Hop, the smart way. It's nearly, well, it's nearly, it's about to be released on the Apple store. Um, it's taken about three years because the bureaucracy behind it's been massive. So that's sort of something I did speak to Becky about when she was going to do this trial and she'd be welcome to use it as part of the trial. But we've put the exercise and education and exercise app. It'll be free to download off, off the app store. It's in Welsh and English. Um, but basically it tells the patients what to do every day exercise wise so there's about 10 or 13 exercises on there and then it also tells them what to do if they go to the local gym or swimming pool etc so and we we're comparing it obviously we've got to check the safety of it ourselves so we're comparing it to our own stores to them patients using the app before okay. it's released yeah so it's a similar we're sort of moving forward a little bit in a similar way as, as becky I agree. I think our physiotherapists have been looking at uh, these sort of uh, social media and ways of getting that message across more. Uh, it's always very difficult to try and put it into research and show how the how effective these things are. Um, and uh, so um, it, it will be certainly useful to see the uptake on these uh, and uh, and how it gets across. And obviously, in the last couple of years with COVID, then we've all been using different platforms more and more as well. Um, yeah, and I'd say there's, there's a growing number of rehabilitation studies that are, are looking at this type of question. Um, you know, where do we need to invest physiotherapy time, and and actually, where do we need the physiotherapy expertise to develop materials and to update them, but they don't need to see them face to face, so that we can put resources into other areas. Um, and the, uh, just thinking of examples that are published, the the GRASP study uh, was in the Lancet not so long ago. That was on shoulder pain. Um, so, so there are recent examples in the Lancet kind of looking at this type of rehab question. Um, I know there's a call for it because um, I presented it on a, a presentation we did during lockdown that ended up on YouTube. I didn't realise it was going to end up on YouTube and I'd mentioned the app on there and my email address is on the end of it. And I get hundreds of emails from all around the world <laughs> asking me where is the app isn't released, we can't find it on the, the app store. Yeah. So. Patients all around the world are obviously searching for something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think particularly Achilles tendon rupture patients. I mean, I remember when I was doing my PhD and the, the, they, they went on to, you know, Achilles tendon forums and they, they're exchanging rehabilitation tips. And um, so, it, you know, I, I think it, it is a long term condition. It's nine months of rehabilitation and people want to seek out other people with similar experiences and talk to them about what they're doing and, and how they're managing. So, Becky, would you, another one's just come through regarding the recent uh, systematic review in the Bone and Joint Journal uh, regarding traditional immobilization versus functional rehab, um, saying there was no difference in re rupture in ATR, ATRS scores. Um, do you have you got a, any comments regarding these these systematic reviews on these now? Um, no, I've, I must admit, I'm not up to date on <laughs> the most recent right. systematic reviews. So I can't comment on it. Okay. Then have you seen it, Anne-Marie? I, sp I suppose a more relevant question then, which people might ask, which is coming through, is what are we doing? Uh, are, pa are we treating any patients uh, with a delay? Now, it's not without the, the studies we've been looking at, uh, those two, your pa two papers, um, but... Amory, you would have had some patients who will have a larger gap and probably have had contraindications towards going to the surgical route. Yeah, and we've done a paper as well on delayed patients mm -hmm. um, using the SMART protocol. So there is a cohort of patients that come through who are delayed. They've got a large gap and, and surgery is not an option for these patients at all um, because of their other comorbidities. So we were offering them, we said, well, look, you can trial this, see if us immobilizing you just shortens the tissues and, and see if it has an effect. And, and we did that. And um, we were finding it was really helping some of our patients. We did their scores pre and post immobilization. Um, and then we did a trial where we called all the patients back and we measured their, uh, not a trial, a study really, just you know, looking at their uh, strength. 
and taking their ATRS scores. Rodri scanned them all, did um, MRI scans in the university. You were looking at the length of the tissue as well, wasn't you, Rodri? On the paper? Yeah. 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 Um, and basically it's 50-50 if it works, works or not. 50-50, okay. Um, and, and what about, you know, whilst we, we've got our, the ultrasonographer, the radiologist there doing the ultrasound, has it made a difference or has it, a, be, did you see a difference in the uh, site of the rupture? Does it make a difference if it's near the bone insertion or up near the, the tender muscular junction? Have you seen any differences in that with the site of rupture? Yeah, Rodri. Uh, well, we try always tried with using the proforma, and that was designed then to actually identify the distance from the calculated insertion um, from the antesis and going there. So we were trying to get always trying to give that information. Uh, anecdotally, I always remember the surgeons coming and saying, "Oh, they do worse at the myotendrous junction." But the interesting thing is that when you start doing lots of Achilles ultrasound. Uh, an, an analysis with ultrasound panels, and then we started doing the MRI. It's the variability in what we say is the length of the tendon, i.e., how far the soleus comes down, the duct blanch up as an accessory soleus, where the myotendinous junction is. Some people have a very long body of tendon, some have quite short tendon. So it seemed to be, as in anything, the anatomical variance was significant. I think that's particularly when you look at that group then that we're looking at a delayed presentation and trying to say, well, has the tendon lengthened? And obviously then you've got a comparison study with the other side. It's actually very difficult on a one-on-one -on -one doing ultrasound because there's a significant variability in the length of the tendon. Obviously, the ones that we're able to say to, in the body of the tendon, we're, we're able to do that. But the pro forma helped us because it would actually then, we would, we would indicate the site on the pro forma on that little diagram of cartoon that. Well, it's, it's, so one of the other modern things that's happened in the last few years, certainly, is the weight-bearing CT. Do you think we should be doing a weight-bearing ultrasound, looking at these patients in a more dynamic position? Uh, well, yeah. <clears throat> seen it may not be very easy. The particularly the range of patients, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Um, to me, and interesting, I, I no longer work with Andrea, I work down in West Wales, and the, the variety in the late presentation to come in, and the, the range of sound uh, of the patients and the extent of care is, is very large. Um, to me, still, I mean, going back to the point I made earlier about how difficult it is to standardize this, it actually is about the positioning and what we actually think is new for the social. Uh, I've never tried doing um, in someone with an acute care doing it weight bearing. Uh, I can't say it would work. Um, I'd have to actually significantly shrink as well because what you have to do when you're scanning calves and doing everything when you look at the muscle areas and things, you try and get the patient up onto a stool and then you, you buy basically kneel on the floor. So it might be fun, but I haven't tried that. I don't, I don't think I'll plan on doing it either for a while. Okay. Well, I think we're going to start to call it a, uh, a wrap there then. Uh, I was going to take Boris as them's the breaks, but I'm not sure we should be using those terms. Um, and, uh, but I, I'm going to say thank you very much to uh, both Amory Hutchison and also Becky Kearney for joining us this evening. Also, thank you to Ash Deep for uh, putting together a, a, a video for the presenting the um, Becky's uh, paper as well uh, and it's been an interesting discussion and it's it's very useful to hear actually from the authors who've been involved in these studies uh, they the feedback and then going on for what's happened since the papers so I'd just like to remind all our participants that they will get uh, questionnaires come through or through the email regarding feedback and also there a QR code will come on uh, after this as well. So thank you very much, everybody.